Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 16, 17, and 18 uh, this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18. As you're opening up there, I uh, want to mention again, as Woody's already mentioned, don't forget to apply. Uh, we just don't think that the building's going to be able to handle all the crowd that plans to come. So the best way we need to do that was to just sort of randomly, and it will be random, we'll, we, I promise, we'll, we, it'll be fair, and we'll hand out those tickets that way. But also, this Wednesday night is lasagna for Lottie. There'll be plenty of lasagna, even if you haven't made a reservation or don't make a reservation. Please come uh, pick some lasagna up from 4.30 to 6.00. Be driving through, you just pull up, and uh, our staff will help you get your plate to lasagna, uh, however many you want, and uh, you'll be able, we'll be able to take money there. But if you'd like to go ahead and pay in advance, just for a quick, uh, quick experience for you on Wednesday, uh, you can do that online or just call Becky in the church office, and and we're 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 probably more more than willing to give you some some store credit as well. Uh, if you're in a hurry and let you pay later. So uh, this is just a way we thought everyone could enjoy sort of supper that night. And, and a live, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there'll be a live debut that night of an interview with Jake and Deb Goforth. They're uh, missionaries in Italy, actually, so we'll have an interview available for you online that night as well. Uh, if you have questions, I know we're throwing a lot of information at you. I was telling somebody the other day, this is stuff we used to just do. I don't know if y'all remember this. We used to come here on Wednesday nights and eat lasagna. And, uh, and, and all these things were really simple. We were trying to tell more and more people to come, uh, not some of these other situations that we're in. So if you have questions, if you're confused about anything, just give us a call in the church office, and I promise you, we, it's our joy to explain these things. Please don't sit and say, well, I don't understand it, so I'm not going to participate, or I'm not going to do this. If you have questions, just give us a call. We'd love to answer those. If you have your Bibles open there, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, why don't you go and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God himself is speaking to us. Beginning verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you for these three beautiful truths that in so many ways sum up what it means to live the Christian life. This morning, Father, as we transition from a day of thanksgiving to a celebration of the coming of our Lord, God, it's our prayer that these truths would work into our hearts during this season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this world is not designed, it's just not set up to make you thankful. The, the rails of this world, if you're riding on them, don't tend to take you, thank you, take you toward gratitude, toward thankfulness. In fact, this world is designed to make you feel like you don't have enough. Many of us still haven't fi finished excavating ourselves out from under all the emails we got on Black Friday and then tomorrow Cyber Monday. Folks telling you, you don't have enough. Our world in so many ways is designed for covetousness. It's designed to kind of make you feel like you need to keep up with the Joneses. Not only though is the world designed to make you feel like you don't have enough, the world's designed to make you want to gripe. Some of y'all don't need help, <laughs> myself included. I won't, I won't mention anyone else. And anyway, I, uh, I won't mention anyone else that doesn't need any help griping. But you can write emails to folks griping. You can write social media posts griping. You can always find somebody just griping. I, people who love to gripe love to bring others into their griping. Oftentimes, I'll have somebody come to me from time to time and say things like, a group of us feel like, and when that happens, I know what's happened. One person's mad, and they find a group of innocent bystanders. They impose their beliefs on them and say, don't you agree with me? And out of fear, they all do. Next thing you know, we've got a mob on our hands. But you know this, I know this, you can always find somebody 
someone to criticize. You can always find something to criticize. This world is designed to make you want to gripe, to make you feel like you don't have enough. It's designed to make you want to compare. We always feel led to look over our shoulder, to assume that others are more happy than we are, to uh, uh, assume that people have a better situation than we have. And as a pastor, I want you to know that oftentimes, from my vantage point, I get to see the grass on both sides of the fence, and the grass indeed is not always greener. I think you just take the way this world is designed, just the, the, the competing spectacles that are drawing our hearts away from thankfulness and towards, a, towards all sorts of gratitude killers, and you add to all of that the unique challenges that we've faced this year, and it becomes clear that it's hard. It's work. It's work for us to be thankful. It's work for us to have thankful hearts and so we read a little phrase today in all things be thankful give thanks in all circumstances we hear that little phrase and you recognize that's about as countercultural of a phrase as you can find you, you don't find sentences that cut against our culture. For some of us, a little phrase like that might even be offensive. Because the first thing you start doing is thinking, so he wants me to be thankful for this? He wants me to be thankful for that? That happened this year? For this? That happened this year? Paul tells us to rejoice, to pray, and to give thanks. And the language seems to indicate that these three things are meant to sort of be understood together in the course of the rest of these simple instructions they're they're sort of a little group here and then they 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 sum up paul sums it up and says these things are the will of god for you in christ jesus these are the weighty things of the christian life this is your big thing i, I think so often we want to do anything and everything but the simple the simple thing it's like our kids will come to us sometimes. Where are they? Right there's one. They're scattered around, I think. They'll come to us and say, can we help? What can we do to help? I say, why don't you go pick your room up? And I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I want to help you. Let me do something big. I say, let me encourage you in this. O over the years, I, I, I say, start with the little things. And I'll have a young man say, I want to do great things for Christ. I, I, I'll, have, I'll have people come, and, or they're an intern, or they're uh, wanting to be in ministry. They'll come and want to talk to someone who's a pastor. And I'll say, they'll say, I want to do great things for Christ. You know what the first thing I say is? Tell me about your grades. Or I'll have a young couple say, we want to be married, and we love each other so much. And I want to say, how do you treat one another? Let me ask you this question. Are you willing to do the small things that are actually the weighty things? The small things that are actually the big things. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And so this morning I want to show you three truths that I think will help you develop a grateful heart according to the will of God. According to the will of God. I think this will help us grow in gratitude. And this week we'll look at thankfulness. And over the next few weeks we're going to look here during this Advent season at just some themes from the Scripture that I think we could really use this year. Thankfulness is the first one. Three truths that will help you develop a grateful heart according to the will of God. Here's the first truth this morning. It's simple. Rejoice always. Rejoice always, Paul says. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice always. I want to tell you something. Simple gratitude. Simple gratitude comes easier when we practice regular rejoicing. Have you ever met a sour person who was thankful? I mean, honest question. I've met some sour people. Have y'all? Folks that are just kind of dour and down on things. And very rarely do you hear a sour person finish a sentence with, but I ought to be thankful. 
Never. There's a sourness to life that results in a sort of sense of entitlement. And yet the Bible gives us a picture of rejoicing that is not only in those moments when you ought to rejoice, but also in those moments when it makes no sense to rejoice. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses, verse 41, the apostles had been taken in by the Sanhedrin, and they had been evaluated in so many ways, and then they get beaten, the Bible says, and then turned to what? Humiliated and beaten. And you know what Acts, chapter 5, verse 41 says? It says, then they left the presence of the council, doing what? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Now think about that for a minute. Now I've had my tail end whooped before. In fact, my favorite football team got their tail end whooped yesterday. And I'm just going to tell you that I did not finish that up. And I don't think anybody in the Auburn locker room yesterday finished that game up and was rejoicing. And then add to that, compound that to being physically beaten by people who are supposed to be your countrymen, people whose Messiah you are proclaiming, and then you get beaten by them, and then you leave rejoicing. Why? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. That is, the name of Christ. Are you thinking about this? Are, are you seeing how radical this phrase, rejoice always, is? Now, when I say that, rejoice always, you may, you may want to kind of want me to kind of go Crystal Cathedral on you and go a little self-help and start saying things like, try to find the positive in every situation and be happy about that. Now, that's not all bad, right? That's a good thing. You, you might be expecting me, when I try to tell you to rejoice always, is just, well, I got hit in the teeth, but at least it didn't knock them all out. I guess I could be happy about that. Instead, let's phrase it like this. Let's take, let's take a step beyond self-help, right? Let, let's have gospel rejoicing in our hearts. Think about it like this. Seek joy as you determine how God is working in every circumstance. That's a deeper, more Christian, more gospel-centered way to think about rejoicing. Not merely just look for the positive in everything and try to be happy about that, but instead transform your vision of even bad things that are happening and try to discern where God is at work and find joy in that reality. Because the reality is joy begets gratitude and gratitude begets joy. I think if you start trying to find joy in difficulties and joy in hard circumstances and try to see the way that the Lord is at work to tap into the rich, rich minds of teaching in the Bible that describes and tells the way that God uses even our sufferings for His good, for our good, and for His glory. I think we can begin to have our attitude transformed, and over time, this rejoicing, this attitude of joy, this seeking joy in God's work, even in our difficult moments, eventually it begins to transform our lives. We're going to be joyful people. Our mourning becomes joy. Our annoyances become rejoicing. Our sourness becomes warmth. And I'm not saying Christians can't be grouchy, but I will say it's hard for Christians to be grouchy for long. Because what we start to do is we start to think, imagine where I would be without the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine where my life would be without the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians begin to think about what they deserve and what they receive. And when you're a Christian, no matter how bad your day gets, you can stop and you can remind yourself, I could be, and God could be just, I could be in hell today. And yet here I am alive another day to praise and serve the Lord Jesus a joyfulness then begins to permeate and to transform your life in such a way that you begin to see all of life in terms of the gospel and joy overflowing is the resulting outcome. The Bible says to rejoice always. Rejoice always. But the Scripture teaches us something else as well. The scripture also says to pray 
without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And I think some of us think that that's the kind of practice that's just sort of for holy rollers. You know what I mean? Folks that just kind of have uh, not a lot going on, and so all they ever do is pray. They sit at home and pray all the time. And I think that's a misconception about what Paul's trying to say. Let's, let's think a little bit about what praying without ceasing means and how it can lead to gratitude. When you think about this sermon and the structure of these three little phrases, think about them like a V. All right, Think, think about them like a V. You've got a real sturdy point in the center, and then from both of them you've had the, the two points. So the middle point is the fulcrum of the V, and the first point is the, this side, and the other point is this side. Both of the, the first and third points are sort of flowing out of this idea. In other words, you've got, you've got pray without ceasing at the center, and it produces a sort of constant rejoicing, and it produces a sort of thankfulness in all circumstances, and prayer, in so many ways, is the fuel for both of those outcomes. In other words, think about it like this. You might be listening to this. You might say, preacher, I just can't help but not be joyful. I can't rejoice. Or you might say, I know I should be thankful. Right? I know I should be thankful. On paper, it makes sense that I should be a thankful person. But it's just not there in my heart. What do I do? How do I start rejoicing? How do I start being thankful? Start praying. And don't stop. Pray without ceasing. I, I think this is an idea of walking in a sort of devotional prayer to the Lord. And it helps us develop a heart of rejoicing and a heart of thankfulness. If, if, if I were to just explain to you what praying without ceasing means, that doesn't mean that every waking minute of every day you pause and say, let us pray. It's not what it means. It means walking in prayer and walking in communion with the Lord in such a way that throughout the course of the day, you're living your life in relation to your relationship to God. Constantly thinking about, Lord, how, how should I think about this? Help, help me bring up scripture to think about this. Lord, help me in this moment. You're never, you never stop thinking about the Lord and what the Lord would have you do. I, pray without ceasing means take everything to the Lord. Now, I'm not one of these people. Now, some of you may be, and I, I praise God for folks that are like this, but I'm not one of these folks who says, Lord, should I have a ham sandwich or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich today? Tell me. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's what this means. Now, listen, if you do that, praise God. I, I, I praise God for that. But what it might look like is, Lord, thank you for this lunch that you've so wonderfully provided for me today. God, thank you for the thankfulness uh, thank you for giving me this, or thank you for giving me that. I think it's important. I think the biblical picture shows that we have to have moments and even sessions of particular prayer before the Lord, special seasons of prayer, special moments of prayer. But the, the picture the Bible's giving us here is of an ongoing personal communion with God throughout each day. P praying without ceasing is like this. It's like this thought. At any moment, you recognize, I'm with the Lord, and the Lord is with me. You live your life knowing that God's not someone you talk to on Sundays. God's not someone who just shows up when it's time to do your morning or evening prayers. God's with me every moment of every day, and praying without ceasing means living our lives with that thought in our hearts and taking things regularly before the Lord. Now, ceaseless prayer, that is, committing our lives to praying to God and to praying without ceasing begins to transform our attitude. If nothing else, one thing it does is it gives us a Godward disposition. When you pray without ceasing, it just becomes hard to forget God. And you think about probably the last time that you really messed up and the last time that you really sinned greatly or the last time that you went through a season of, of not having a, a close walk with Christ, more than likely the odds are that you just sort of forgot the Lord for a while. You got into a habit of not going to the Lord in prayer. You got into a habit of not considering 
who God is. But if we are to live Christian lives like the Bible calls us to, we must have a Godward disposition. We must constantly be thinking about how our actions and our attitude impacts our relationship with God. Prayer and regular prayer aligns our lives in a Godward direction. Puts our lives on the rails of faithfulness to the Lord. But not only that, prayer is also a means by which God makes us more like Jesus. One of the means by which God has deemed necessary for you to grow in Christian faithfulness, for you to become more like Jesus, one of the designs that God has is to use prayer in that way. And so often I think we miss something important about prayer. I think we think prayer is exclusively for us to try to change God's mind, right? We, we think prayer is exclusively for us to try to convince God of something. And, and I don't think that's a, a really healthy way of thinking about prayer. Instead, when we go to the Lord in prayer, no matter what we're asking for, the Lord may answer that prayer affirmatively. He may give us exactly what we're asking for. But so often, haven't you experienced that after you've prayed about something for a long time, that your desires change over time? Because God uses prayer to make you more like Him. So often, so often we think prayer is about us bending the will of God, whereas so often prayer is about God bending our will, transforming our desires, changing our heart. And God uses prayer to form us into the image of a son. But also, one other way that prayer transforms our attitudes is it gives us an opportunity to bring everything before the Lord. It's a life liturgy of praying, a life liturgy of bringing things before the Lord. I think that it's harder for certain moments and certain situations to drag you into sin when you are constantly taking each situation before the Lord, constantly thinking about how the Lord would respond to this situation. I want to encourage you, if you're struggling to be grateful, if you're struggling to be joyful, to see if praying without ceasing might not be a good solution for you. And you also may be, and it's very likely that you are, struggling to pray for long periods of time. Right? You, you know, you, you're, you say, I'm going to pray for an hour a day. And you sit down, and at 6.45 you've got your coffee, and you pray for an hour, and you wake up, and it's 6.51. And uh, I understand that, right? I understand how that can be. But maybe the Lord is less concerned with you sitting down and praying for an hour and more concerned with you bringing your life before Him as you walk through life, as you go about your day. Maybe, maybe this, so often we hear pray without ceasing and it feels daunting to us, but I hope you'll see it as a breath of fresh air. The Lord's with you and you're with the Lord. He cares about you. He wants you to cast all your burdens and cares upon Him. He's there with you. Talk to Him. Spend time with Him. And so, when we rejoice always, when we pray without ceasing, it's difficult, right? It becomes difficult to be ungrateful. It becomes difficult not to be thankful. And that leads us to our last point this morning. It's this, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Let me ask you a question this morning. How can you and how will you cultivate a heart of thankfulness when it's hard to be thankful. Now, I'm not talking about Thanksgiving Day when there's a big fat turkey on the table and everybody's around or most of your family's around and you're thankful to have them there and everything else. We, we, we know to be thankful then. We know at least we better fake it, you know. But I'm talking about the days when it's difficult. So often when things are good, we just automatically thank God. And just to be frank, we're sort of afraid not to thank God when things are good. Some of that's not Christian faithfulness. Some of that's superstition. We're just afraid we're going to mess the blessings up. We better be thankful. God might take them away. And yet the life of faith, the Bible says, thanks God in every circumstance. Now why is that? 
Why is it that we are thankful to God in every circumstance? It's because we trust that the Lord means good for us no matter what we encounter. How could He not? How, how could good not, God not? Now think about this for a moment. God means good for you no matter what you encounter. And you may say, I have a hard time believing that. Because I've encountered some things that aren't good. And, and listen, I'm not trying to flatten your life out in such a way that says that good things are, are not that good and bad things are not that bad, that everything's the same. That's not the case at all. And I don't think God's asking us to flatten the reality of how bad, bad things can be and how good, good things can be. And I think God wants us to experience a range of emotions in relation to with things when they are not as they should be and when things are wonderful and great. We ought to respond to those things with healthy emotions. And yet there's an underlying hope and there's an underlying faith in the Christian life that no matter what we encounter, when we meet high highs and when we meet low lows, we recognize God means good for us even in these circumstances. And we know that precisely because He has loved us and treasured us through His Son, Jesus Christ. The gospel teaches us that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That God came here to save us. And if God is willing to go to such great lengths to save our souls through the gospel of His Son, don't you think and don't you believe that God means good for you in every circumstance? My friends, I want you to know that cultivating a heart of thankfulness and the ability to thank God in all circumstances will transform your life. Now, I, I, I love God's people. I think you guys know that. I love this church. I'm thankful for the saints here at First Baptist Church. And sometimes there will be a church member going through a really difficult trial. And I'll call them. And I'll think, what am I going to say to encourage this saint of the Lord? You know, what words am I going to have to comfort them? And by the time we hang up, I realize I didn't encourage them today. They encouraged me. They've been wrestling with this, and somehow in this sickness, in this trial, in the loss of a loved one, somehow they have a heart of thankfulness that is such an inspiration to me that though I tried to call and encourage them, it was them who really and truly encouraged me. It'll transform your life. Because I've also met other Christians, different times. Not necessarily in this church, but just throughout my life, I've encountered people who, when going through a trial, when going through some difficulty, the way they talk sounds like they feel like they were entitled to better. They're not grateful at all. And this trial becomes a double trial for them. Because not only are they suffering like anyone else would, but beyond that, they're questioning God and they're frustrated with the Lord and they're sour about the situation they found themselves in because they have not cultivated a heart of thankfulness. They feel entitled to blessings because they've served the Lord. That's not the message of the gospel. Your life will be transformed as you cultivate a heart of thankfulness and you will begin to see that you get peace and joy in the midst of trials because you recognize you have a good father to whom you can be thankful no matter what. And perhaps, just perhaps, in a world that struggles to be grateful, have you ever thought that maybe Christian thankfulness, a grateful heart, is one of the greatest apologetics for the Christian faith in the world around us. And, and I mean this not only for how you behave on the worst days, but just how we handle minor inconveniences in life. Our thankfulness is so often a barometer by how much we really believe and trust in the gospel. Do we really trust that Jesus means good for us? And I want you, I want you to try something. I want you to, 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 to try a little experiment during the Christmas season, okay? Um, a, a couple things. Intentionally show thankfulness to people around you. Wherever you're shopping for Christmas presents, I promise you, it's been the hardest year ever at that store. It's been the hardest year ever for whoever's serving you during this season for waiters and waitresses, for anybody you encounter. My, my brother-in-law works for Amazon, and he's 
working all kinds of overtime trying to make sure packages get to your house so that you don't holler at a UPS driver when they get there, right? It's a hard season for so many people. And I want you to, I want to hear stories during this time of you going above and beyond and being thankful. Not once thinking, well, that's their job, that's what they ought to do. Not once thinking anything like that, but intentionally being thankful. How might the Lord open doors for the gospel for you? Many of you are like me, you've got habits. You go certain places over and over again. What if you just said, I'm going to intentionally show a grateful heart? You might have more opportunities to preach the gospel than you e- and share the gospel than you ever thought you would with the way that gratitude opens the door for folks. Folks love to be appreciated. Folks love that. And we are Christians. We've been given more than we could ever deserve. Surely we can turn around and have a heart of thankfulness to the world that God's called us to serve. If I had to give advice to a new Christian or a young man entering ministry or a young Christian woman who's soon to be married or a person who's graduating college college and entering the workforce and starting their career, to new parents if I had to give advice, or if someone came to me and asked me how to be a radical Christian, Pastor, how can I just blow the doors? Of Christianity. I've got so much passion. I've got so much energy. I really want to be after it. How do I push back against the world? How, how can I really, really, really be countercultural? If any of you said, Pastor, what do you feel like is, is just something simple I could do that would transform my walk with the Lord? This would be my advice Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I just want to give you the opportunity today to respond to the Lord. If you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus for the first time, when this service is over today, I'd love for you to come speak to me. But right now, we're exactly where you are, when our altar is not quite open yet, again because of COVID concerns, right there where you are, if you'll turn from your sins in repentance and turn to God and faith through Jesus Christ, I believe you'll be saved. And second of all, second of all, if you're a Christian, you say, Pastor, I just need to grow in these three areas. You take this time of reflection now to grow, and I'd love to talk with you when the service is over as well. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. Get with me after the service is over. But right now, right where you are, I want you to respond to the Lord as He's leading you today. After this prayer... I want to invite you to respond to Christ. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his gospel. God, we thank you for this wonderful Advent season as we prepare to celebrate Christmas. And God, I pray that you will give us grateful hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray.